We're going to first start in, in the book of Acts, and we'll be going to Thessalonians, of course, real soon. Acts chapter 16. Because Paul believed that God had called him to preach the gospel to the people in Philippi after seeing a vision. And I want to read to y'all part of that vision. It's in a Roman, excuse me, Acts chapter 16, verse 9 and 10. It says, And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over to, unto Macedon, into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. So this is how we got him over there. But Paul established a strong church there in Philippi during his three months while he was there. But he left after being arrested and beaten for preaching the gospel. So you have to admire the courage of Paul and his team for their amazing commitment and courage to continue their assignment after their experience in Philippi. Instead of retreating, he and his team carried the message of Christ to Thessalonica, the largest city in Macedonia. And there he was there for three Sabbaths, teaching in their synagogues. But when a strong persecution rose up, he went to Berea, and that was a town about 30 miles away. And the people in this town welcomed the message, but the Jews in Thessalonica didn't like it. The same ones that persecuted Paul there and his team came to Berea to attack the gospel and stir up trouble there. And those new believers in Berea uh, were so concerned about Paul's safety that they immediately sent him away. But it was from, uh, from that point uh, Paul went to Athens, and then he went to Corinth. Well, he wrote these two letters that we're been, we'll be studying in this End Times message series. But he wanted these people that he had met in, in, Thessalonica, in Thessalonica, Thessalonica. You can go back there now for me, please, in Thessalonians chapter 3. He wanted them to know that how he was doing, of course, because they saw how he left, but he also wanted to assure them of his love for them. And he also wanted to reestablish the fundamental truths that he had already taught them. He wanted to encourage them to remain faithful in persecution and to bring them comfort concerning those who had already died in the faith, because they were concerned about that. So in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, is a very short chapter. It's only 13 verses. But in this chapter... Uh, he continues to write to the new believers to encourage them in their walk with the Lord. And in, the, in chapter 1, he reminded them about the promise, and we taught on that in the first lesson, that Jesus would come back for his church. In chapter 2, he let them know about his joy at the return, how they would be his joy at the return of Jesus when he would meet them all together in the air. And in our lesson tonight, we're going to be studying about the things that will happen in heaven after the rapture of the church. Each chapter in this whole series is going to be progressive. I told you every chapter in, in First and Second Thessalonians has some reference to the end times or the um, coming of Jesus. So it's, we're going we're gonna to go there, okay? Let's read the whole chapter and then we'll comment on it. First Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1, all the way through verse 13. It says, wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone. I just referred to that when I talked about where, how he had gotten where they were and how he left. Verse 2, and, he's, and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. For verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation even as it, as it came to pass, and you know. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. But now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith, notice how often he talks about their faith. And charity, he says, this means love, that you have 
that you have good remembrance of us always desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you. Verse 7. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live if we stand fast in the Lord. And for what thanks can we render to God again for you for all the joy wherewith we joy in your sakes before God? You notice they had such a close relationship. <clears throat> Verse 10, he goes on to tell them, Night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. So he had a strong desire to reconnect with these brethren, these people that he had only really spent th about one month with, three Sabbaths. And I'm sure they spent times on those other days together as well, just going over the scriptures, and he was building them up and strengthening them. So he, was, he still desired to, to perfect their faith with the word of God that was in him that he knew. That's why he's writing to them. Verse 11, Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you, and the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you, to the end that, you, that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Glory to God. That, what, that's the word of God. Hallelujah. It's so good. And the way he all puts it all together, you can see, hear his heart. You can hear his passion for these people, for the calling that God has placed upon his life. He was, he was always attentive and spending time thinking about them. And then when he gets to Corinth, he writes this letter to them. Now, in this last verse of this chapter, we see the bottom line reason for Paul's concern for these young believers. He wanted them to be ready for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ with all of his saints. And what we just read in verse 13 is really referring to the rapture of the church. We talked a lot about that in the last couple of service uh, teachings, of part one and part two. But for those of you that may be new to this study and have never heard about the rapture, this is when Jesus comes in the clouds for his church. And in previous studies, we read scriptures that clearly reveal to us that at that moment, when Jesus comes in the clouds, the dead in Christ will rise first, and then we which are alive will meet them in the air. Hallelujah. That's the rapture of the church. We've read it in different scriptures last week, and we'll read more next week in chapter 4 is where it's really recorded the best. We'll study that out more. But when he's talking about coming, the coming of the Lord with all of his saints, it could not refer, refer to the event when the saints will accompany Christ to the earth, because that's not when we are presented to the Father. This is, this is the point when we go come with Jesus to heaven. Now that's exciting to me. I don't know about you guys. We've been looking for, not for just him coming. He doesn't just come and we all just stay jumping around in the air, flipping on the clouds. No, we got to go to heaven with him, right? It refers to the coming of Jesus with the saints back to heaven to be with him, and the Father after he meets us all in the air. So the Bible also refers to this as the blessed hope of the church. And we teach that and believe that in this church. But what happens to the church after that glorious moment? What do you think that happens? We're going to study this. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 4. Revelations chapter 4. What can we look forward to once we get into heaven? You know, like, uh, we don't just sit around and play harps. You know, name bugs, look around, pick, pick grapes or something, share food with people. There's something we're going to be doing, right? I believe that... Um, when we get to heaven, this is when the saints will receive rewards, experience the marriage supper of the Lamb, and then that is the moment when we see the seals and all the things broken out that will release the wrath of God from heaven that will be poured out upon the earth. 
And uh, we're, gonna, we're not going to get in a deep study of all of that, but I want to see where this is referenced at in Revelation chapter 4. We're going to read four from uh, verse 1, chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, all the way down to 11. So you can see it for yourself in the scriptures. And after this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow around the throne in the sight like unto an emerald. And, the round, and round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps in the fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne there were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast was like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the fourth beast had such, and the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they, they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth and forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him and that sat on the throne and worship him that lived forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they were created. Praise the Lord. What a scene. What a scene that, that John saw that day. You know, the phrase that begins in verse 1 that says, after this, is referring to the previous chapters where John recorded what, Je what Jesus said to the seven churches. And, you know, and this is what's going on because it, it shows that this is the fulfillment of those events. That what's happening that we saw in Thessalonians and right here settles the question as to the time of the fulfillment of these things. They have to refer to the things about these churches, you see, and, or after the rapture of the church, because the church is no longer on the earth uh, when the events of Revelation chapter 4 all the way through Revelation 22 take place. The church is gone. That's because we've already had the rapture of the church. So this portion of what we're studying tonight is really talking about what happens when the rapture of the church occurs and we're not here, we're in heaven. Well, we already see this is this beautiful scene that uh, what was going on at that time. So we're going to see a lot more tonight because the door in, the verse, in verse 1 that we just read was a real opening into heaven. In the Greek, it's the word therura, which is a portal or an entrance. It means a door or a gate. It's translated 36 different times, including in Matthew when Jesus was teaching on the prayer principles during the Sermon of the Mount when he says, but thou when thou prayest, y'all will remember this verse, but thou when thou prayest, enter in thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to the Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Same word used for door there. So it was a door, it was a portal, it was an opening that John saw when he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Amen. You're not going to really, uh, you know, the Bible gives you a, a promise of a blessing in the beginning of the book of Revelation for everybody that will read that book. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's going to take some, some thought and, and the spirit revelation to help you to understand all of it and understand this, that it's not always sequential. It, it's not always like na -na -na -na, right on a row. So you just have to be led and, and study it out in the scriptures and it's, it's um, 
It's a beautiful journey. We're not going to have time to go into all of that because we're really studying in Thessalonians, but I still wanted you to see this part in Revelation chapter 4 because it's so important. Also in verse 4, we just want to point out that these, something about these 24 elders, their joint rule with Christ, their white garments, their golden crowns, all indicate seemingly that these, rep, these 24 represent the redeemed of the Lord. And the question then is, who, what, what uh, redeemed? Which redeemed are they? It's not Israel, since the nation is not yet saved, glorified, or coronated. That's still to come uh, at this point, and that's going to happen towards the end. We'll see, you can see that if you read more in the study. We'll talk a little more about that, actually, in, Romans, in the Roman study we're going to be coming to. But, uh, and also, not, it's not Israel, because their resurrection and glory will come at the end of the seven-year tribulation time, and you, we'll find that in Daniel. We may have time to go to that another day. But the tribulations, and the tribulation saints, those who are in the tribulation and get saved, aren't saved yet. So this is not who the redeemed is that we're talking about these elders. The only group that will be complete and glorified at this point will be the church. So the, here the elders represent the church, which sings the song of redemption that we just read in verse 8 through 10. And they are the overcomers, the ones who have their crowns and live in the place prepared for them that Jesus talked about in John 14. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. Amen. Amen. Well, did he say that? Amen. And if I go, he says, don't be troubled. He says, because I'm going away. But if I go away, I'm going to come back. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And he's coming back to bring us to that place that he's been preparing for over 2,000 years. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. You know, I heard, uh, I I like to listen to a lot of different preachers. And just this last week, I was listening to uh, Richard Roberts. He He was preaching for Nancy Dufresne, who's been here at the church before. She'll be coming back. I was talking with her about that when I was with her and Jesse uh, recently. Anyway, he told a, a, a joke, and I thought it was a cute joke about, he says, you know, there's this old elderly couple that, that, that died together, and they were, they were coming into heaven, and they're seeing all the beautiful throne room, they've seen all the glory, they've seen the beautiful streets and all this, and the husband turns to the wife and says, you know, if we wouldn't have been taking all them vitamins, eating so healthy, we'd have been here 10 years ago. <laughs> You know, why are we fighting so hard to not go? I mean, that, because God wants us here. We have an assignment. We shouldn't go before our time. Don't get me wrong. But that's going to be a great place. We should not fear death. Right? The Bible talks about cry when the baby's born and rejoice when the saints go on to heaven. We got our perspective mixed up sometime. But heaven's going to be a beautiful place. So he's talking about those, we just read this in chapter 4, which is so powerful, but I want us to turn to chapter 19 as well. We're going to just read a little in Thessalonians before we go back to our study. Revelation 19. In this passage of scripture, we're going to see the church celebrating at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And the marriage feast of the Lamb is mentioned only in Revelation 19. We've all heard about it, we all talk about it, but it's only mentioned in this book of the Bible in verse 7 and verse 9. Everything that we know about it, in, according to Scripture, is here. It's everything that's revealed. But we're going to read Re- uh, Revelation chapter 19, verse 1, all the way to verse 10. It's okay to read these chunks of Scripture, right? Because I, I, mean, I can't explain it any better than this. And I really like you to go and find it for yourself and know where it's at as well. And this is this phrase again, after and after these things. Notice how chapter 4 was the same way. It started with after these things, talking about the things about the churches. Jesus talking about all to the seven churches, the messages that he gave them. And then all of a sudden the church is gone. After these things, the church is out of there. Now right here, here it is, chapter 19, verse 1. And after these things... Uh, and these things between this four, chapter 4 and 19 is a lot of the wrath of God being poured out. All of these things reveals the, they'll talk about the Antichrist, the, the, uh, the mark of the beast. All these things we're not going to get into because we're not studying Revelation. But we've, we've kind of given you an overview in the past. We don't have time to get into all of that. 
But there's a lot of great things to read. You should read that if you haven't read the book of Revelation. It says, and after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Alleluia. And her smoke arose, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all his servants, and you that fear him, both small and great. Verse 6, And I heard, as it were, of the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of the mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb, and he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. This is such an awe-inspiring passage of Scripture. Just see what we have to look forward to and how awesome it will be. You see, John sees the marriage of the Lamb in heaven while he's here on earth. And the marriage supper of the Lamb is an actual meal in heaven, and it's the final manifestation of the marriage of Christ and his church. Do you remember at the Last Supper where he told his disciples, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine till we are up, till we are together in heaven? He's talking about this very moment right here. So powerful. And the fact that it talks about how much people are in heaven, it proves that they have been caught up in time for the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we're talking about all the people from eternity that, that believed in God, Jesus, even before he came, like righteous Abraham, like others, others that were living for God, that, that looked forward to the cross. Those who uh, walked with Jesus and saw him, and then after his resurrection believed in him, and uh, were born again in the whole the church, that first century church, and everybody since then that's been, been witnessed to or heard the gospel and received it, uh, including this generation here in 2024, those that maybe have passed on in years past that we all may know, some of us have family members that are there, we're all going to be caught up. Those dead in Christ are going to rise first, then we which are alive and, re will, and remain will be caught up together with them in the air, and so shall we ever be, the word tells us. Hallelujah. Can anybody give a shout for that? That's some good, that's some good news. And this is the kind of stuff that Paul taught to these brand new believers when he was in Thessalonica. They hadn't, a lot of them may not even heard about God at all, heard about Jesus. Here it is, a, a, a rabbi, an Orthodox Jew coming in here who's converted on that road to Damascus, totally transformed, and he comes out here bringing the message that God called him to be a light to the Gentiles. And he came there because he first heard, saw a vision. Here he is, wherever he was. I forget where he's at, and he's going on his missionary journey. But he sees this vision of this man in Macedonia, which is, you know, the European continent. And he says, come over here and give us this gospel. So he immediately goes, takes his team. I remember reading this so many times in one, and he gives a vision of a man. But here he goes to Philippi, and he meets a woman. A, a prosperous woman, a woman who was a businesswoman, Lydia, a dyer of purple, the Bible talks about. And what did she have? She had a prayer meeting right there around by the river. And uh, so she, and that's who he went and he connected with first. And then later he started preaching in the streets. And he started connecting with the people. And then he, I don't know how long he was there. I think he was there about three months, actually. And then he, he there's this woman that kept following him around because there was other uh, other uh, 
things people worshiped in the area, and she was hollering out, oh, this, they have a plan of salvation. And, and she kept saying what sounded like the right thing, but it, it, was, it just got, Paul couldn't take it anymore. He turned around, you shut up, and he rebuked the devil. She was one who would, um, I think she would prophesy or she would, uh, like a fortune teller. And, and she made a lot of money for her masters. And so they got upset because he, all of a sudden, she's born again. She don't have that, that uh, familiar spirit again, anymore to make money for these guys. So they get aggravated. They throw him in prison. And this is why they, he's in prison. And so they all get aggravated, and they try to they beat him up, and they find out that he's a Roman citizen, so they try to get him out of town quickly. So, uh-uh. You, you didn't do this privately. You got, I'm gonna get out. So he, they got out of prison, and here they are in this little town of 10,000, which is not a little town, but it, was, it wasn't just a uh, few people. So they knew what was going on, and then that's what drove. From there, he went to, to Thessalonica, which was 100 miles away, to a city of 200,000, and just got right in the middle of it again. Three Sabbaths. His custom was to go to the Sabbath first and preach and show how Jesus was the Christ, the one they're all looking for. I know him, I saw him. And that was his message to these people. And he imparted what his whole soul to them, he, we talked about in chapter two. I didn't just give you my, you know, the word. I gave you the word, but I also gave you my whole soul. He imparted life to these people. His, the spirit that was within him was contagious. And he, and he went around flinging sparks everywhere. He went around igniting other people. And so when he left, he didn't leave the way he wanted to. He wanted to stay longer. And so he, um, you know, when we studied the book of Ephesians, we know he stayed there in Ephesus about three years. He was able to spend a lot of time with that church to get him really off and going. Ephesus became the biggest church in all of Asia for the longest time. And then they had persecution again that rose up and had difficulties. Timothy... This little guy we read about here tonight was his protege and was the first pastor of the church after Paul there in Ephesus. So all of these guys worked together. They were a team. Amen. But they were all passionate and carried that, that equal, they were like precious faith and uh, brought the gospel where God told them to bring it. Amen. Amen. So here, this was so powerful to see that um, this is what happened. He was telling them about the rapture of the church and how you're going to go to heaven one day. And even though people may have passed away because y'all are suffering persecution, you know, arresting people, we're all going to come together in heaven one day. So be encouraged. Stir up your faith. Don't give up. Be diligent. Stay faithful. Stay holy. Live for God. Amen? Amen. So... Um, this is what he's talking about. These much people or some of these people that Paul's up there. Paul will be up there when we go up, right? We're going to meet him in the air. Amen. They, they, they tortured him, and they, they took, cut his head off But when he passed. Uh, but uh, he's going to have his head <laughs> when we all get together. Amen? Amen. God's going to resurrect that body. There's God resurrect, no matter where they are, they will be resurrected first, and then we will meet them in the air. But uh, at the rapture, the saints will go immediately to heaven where we're going to remain for the last seven years of this age during the tribulation. And we went through several scriptures that show that last week. Now, the Dakes Bible commentary, which I like to look at from time to time, it has a lot of interesting things, and it, it tends to number a lot of things. But I thought this one would be interesting for, to read off to you. It lists eight events between the rapture and the return of Christ with his saints to the earth. So there's some things that go on in heaven. This is what we're really focusing in on tonight's uh, teaching, is that we're caught up with Jesus to go to heaven, to meet, be presented to the Father. And so what else is going on in heaven? Well, number one, he says we're presentation before God. And, uh, and he says that the saints are to be declared blameless. We read that in the scriptures tonight. And then for the third thing, he says that you're going to have settlement in mansions. It means you're going to find out where your house is. Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. In my, house, in my father's house, there are many mansions. So some people uh, think of that as a literal mansion. It may or may not be. Maybe you may rather have a condo. Wherever it is, you're going to have a place to live. Amen. And that's uh, 
a great thing to think about. And then the fourth thing is the judgment of the saints. We're going to talk about that in a moment. And then uh, the fifth thing he writes down is regular worship. We'll be worshiping God. Uh, and there'll be this the routine of living seven years up there in heaven with Jesus and everybody else. Think about it. Oh, what a, a reunion that's going to be. What a beautiful reunion. You're going to, you know, there are going to be so many people that I'm going to be able to meet in heaven that I couldn't really meet here on earth. Maybe I've taught them, or maybe they've, I've written to them, or maybe they've read one of my books, and, or, and I know there are people that my husband's led to the Lord. Sometimes when we've done through broadcasts in different ways like that, we don't really know them. We'll get letters from them. We've never really seen them in person, but we'll have a great reunion where we'll get to see that and see the fruit of all the things we've done and, and connect with people that, uh, you know, sometimes we, we meet up with people that we are, are all busy doing something for the Lord and we don't have time to spend together. You know, so you've heard that phrase, uh, well, you know, you'd love to just see them again, spend time with them. So we, we, we all have a phrase. You may use it some time to time yourself. It says, here, there, or in the air, you know. We're going to see you somewhere. But we're con we're, if it's not here, I'll see you in heaven because it's a real thing. Amen? Amen? So we'll have routine living, number six, is how Dake says it. And the seventh thing was the marriage supper of the Lamb, which we just talked about. And the eighth thing is preparation for the second coming, the battle of Armageddon, and the establishment of the eternal government on earth. So when Jesus comes back with the saints, and he comes on that white horse, which we talked about, He's going to come uh, with the saints, and we're going to be coming with him. So that's going to be an exciting time. So those are the kind of things we're going to be pre pre a preparation time for that. So we're going to be busy. We're going to have a lot to do, a lot of catching up time, a lot of growing up time. Some people are going to learn some things that they need to know that they didn't learn while they were here. Amen. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians. I want us to read about the judgment seat of Christ and talk about that a little bit tonight before we close. Uh, because this is going to happen after the resurrection of the saints, uh, when we're judged for the things that are done in the body, whether they be good or bad. You may have heard about the judgment seat of Christ. This is not at all and not even close to what the Bible talks about, the great white throne judgment, which is at the end, uh, later at the end when Jesus returns to the earth, which I just referred to. But this uh, judgment seat of Christ will occur during the marriage supper of the Lamb, and every believer will stand before Christ to receive rewards. We could read, we're going to read two passages of Scripture that show us where this is at in the Bible. 2 Corinthians is the first one, chapter 5. We're going to read verse 6 through 10. Has anybody ever heard about the judgment seat of Christ? Can I just see hands? A few of you already know about this. Uh, it says, for, uh, verse 6, therefore, are y'all there yet? Amen. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Verse 10 is where we really want to get to, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So this describes the deepers, our motivation for, and our highest aim for pleasing God should be that one day we're going to be, uh, have rewards for it. We should realize that every one of us are uh, accountable to God and, and this is really what the judgment seat of Christ is all about. Now, this word judgment seat refers to the place where the Lord will sit to evaluate believers' lives for the purpose of giving them eternal rewards. This is not talking about salvation, because you already have salvation, which is why you went up in the rapture of the church. This is not, you're not going to lose your salvation. This is where you receive rewards for what you did while you were here. Amen? Amen. 
And we're just going to touch on some of this. I'm not going to have time to go into a huge amount of detail, but we're going to talk enough that you'll get the, that it is really something to look forward to, not to dread. Uh, the judgment seat refers to the place where the Lord will sit to evaluate believers' lives. Evaluate. Think about that. For the purpose of giving them eternal rewards. And it's translated from the Greek word bema. You may have heard that, which is an elevated platform. This would technically, what we have behind me, called a bema. We call it the platform. Uh, but this is where Jesus would sit in this elevated place. And that's what happened in, in, in the Greek word. They used that because it was an elevated platform where victorious athletes during the Olympics went to receive their crowns. And Corinth had such a platform where both athletic awards rewards and legal justice was dispensed. So the Corinthians understood Paul's reference when he was speaking about this. And I'm sure he taught this to the church at Thessalonica as well. So Paul was referring to all those activities that believers do during their lifetimes that relate to their eternal reward uh, and praise from God. So there's things that we do. And uh, let's turn to another passage of scripture in uh, 1 Corinthians, so right now we've been in 2 Corinthians, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, <clears throat> because like I said, this reward is not salvation, which scriptures teach us is a free gift, but a, re a reward is something for your faithful service. You're not going to earn your salvation, you have to receive that totally by faith. It's not of worse works, the Bible tells us, lest any one of us should boast, Jesus paid the price. All we do is believe it and receive it. But once we become born again, we're saved unto good works. We should do those things that bring glory and honor to God. We should serve him. Amen? Amen. So it's a reward. So we're talking about rewards when we talk about the judgment seat of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9 through 15 gives us insight into this. It says, For we are laborers together with God, you are God's husbandry, you are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. But if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved yet as by fire. So what we do in our temporal bodies here will have an impact for eternity. Paul's point was not that believers shouldn't enjoy uh, earthly things. It's that they should glorify God in them and spend most of our time and our energy uh, in what has an eternal value. Hallelujah. This whole thing about, you know, a lot of people do good works for God for the wrong reason. If you're doing that, you're not going to get any reward for it. If you're doing it to be seen of others, if you're not doing it as unto him, if you're just doing it to make, make you think yourself look better and pride has gotten a hold of you, then, and you're, or you're legalistic and you're angry because somebody else isn't doing it, you've lost all of your rewards. So the rewards are based on doing things out of your heart as unto the Lord. Amen. So I think we're going to all, some of us are going to be pretty surprised when we get up there thinking that certain ones are going to get their rewards, but maybe they didn't do what God was really calling them to do. They did what they wanted to do rather than what God was calling them to do. We're going to be required to do our assignment, not someone else's assignment. I don't have to fulfill someone else's call, but I have to step into mine whether I'll understand it fully and, and just walk out my own salvation with fear and trembling. Because we all are going to be accountable to one. So our hearts should be pure in this, and we should be 
searching God and realizing that the rapture is a real thing. The, Jesus is coming. And when he does come, thank God those that are born again, we're all going to be caught up together with him. But when we get there, there's going to be a judgment seat of Christ. And there's going to be some of us that are going to be, have rewards because we've been obedient to do whatever it is that God called us to do whether that's sweeping the church or whether that's serving in a certain area with the children or if that was your calling and you're not doing it out of resentment and you're, you're happy and you've got fruit, you've won little kids to the Lord, you know, or if you're, you've called to, to sing or worship and that's what, God, that's what God has called you to do, not that you're just there because you want to do it. You know, God will lead you and guide you into the thing that he's called you to do. Right. And um, so often... You just do whatever needs doing, and that's good, too. We, we, we say, Lord, I'm here. Do whatever, whatever it is, Lord, you want me to do, I'll do it. And sometimes you just do whatever's in front of you, and you start moving along, and you do that. But there comes a time when he reveals his perfect path for you. But while, while, till you get to that perfect that place or know where that place is, you just do whatever you, what, what's around you to do, and you're faithful in it. The key is being faithful in whatever it is you commit to do. And uh, everyone, uh, God's work will get done if everybody just stays in their place, stays in their lane and not trying to uh, run the whole show themselves or being critical. It's so important to realize that um, the whole point of Paul writing to this church at Thessalonica was because he wanted them to be ready. And that's my heart for you, too. I want you to be ready. I want you to understand these things. I don't want you to just be blindsided uh, when attacks come because we, we know that this is the, the last of the last days. We know that the enemy is on a rampage. The world is, is upside down in so many different ways. I was talking to someone today that, you know, anybody that maybe even if you don't know God, maybe you've never even heard of Jesus, you, you have to be brain dead to not know that something's crazy going on. I mean, and if you just, and I believe that people are in a position more than ever to hear words of, of wisdom from people that have read the Bible. You all have to say, you know, have you, all you, even if you even say, Lord, have, you know, talk to someone and say, you know, have you ever actually read the Bible? Why don't you just do that? Take a little time and do that. And just put a bug, you know, and pray for them. Pray for people. And God will put a hunger in them and they'll pick it up and their lives will be changed. Amen. All of us have an assignment to live for God, of course, once we're born again. But the same way that Paul had a passion to spread the good news to those around him, I mean, we, we need to catch hold of that and be passionate about uh, keeping the message going because it's something that needs to be heard. Not Enough people have not heard the message of the gospel in the right way with passion and love and wisdom. Amen. They need to know that Jesus is coming back and he's going to be, and they can go to heaven one day with him. Amen? That's good news. I love it. I'm telling you what, we have, a, we have an assignment, I think, uh, to get busy and, and share the gospel with people that, that um, some have heard it and they think they know, or they've gotten busy and gotten hardened to it, but they can get refreshed. Amen? Because, and you know how you do it? You get on fire yourself. And all of a sudden, it's going to spill over. You're going to spark out, spark uh, someone else's uh, life. When, uh, years back, the Lord gave me a vision of how the world was parched and dry, like, just like kindling. And all it needed was one spark from someone to just ignite a life and change a life. And so many people don't even know they're dry. They don't even realize why they are pursuing some of the things they're pursuing. They're just caught up in, in a whirlwind of some type, and they're, they're not satisfied in life. They're, they're, they're popping up on stuff. They're drinking up stuff. They're doing all kinds of things to substitute what only God can feel. And uh, the reality of that just needs to be communicated uh, to people. And I believe that God is going to use us, the church here, and different ones, those that are listening online, because I know people listen to this uh, later when we post it on Saturdays, and it's reaching a lot of people as well. But it's important to know that God uh, wants to use you as a vessel to proclaim, and I see many of you that are already on fire doing it, 
and spreading the good news to people and being a light for Jesus. And it's so important to do that. Amen? Amen. Uh, next week in part four of our End Times message series, we're gonna, uh, uh, the message will be call, called Caught Up Together. We're going to go even more deeper into all the things we, we're going to talk about on the End Times. Are you all ex- enjoying this? Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's so b- wonderful that we can study the Word of God. And, and I don't know about you, but I'm learning more as I study. Did anybody learn anything new tonight? Yeah. Anything that's going to help you? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word tonight. Lord, just all of us just want to be vessels used by you. Lord, we pray that, that we'll be uh, used by you to reach others, Lord, to be, be a, a conduit for your glory and your blessing to the world. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you, Lord. Lord, I thank you for your anointing that's available to your people. Hallelujah. Lord, I thank you for those the still small voices that lead and direct. Lord, I thank you that you're speaking and directing and guiding your church, you're guiding your people. Even tonight, Lord Jesus, with a oh kind of with a clear direction, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that this is the time to gather our our strength, to gather our our, uh, our assignments, Lord, and to work together as a team to fulfill what you called us to do right here in this local church. Lord, I thank you that you're raising up leaders, that you're giving them assignments, and Lord, and that you're calling more people to, to come to hear the word of God as we're proclaiming where you're glorified in this place, Lord Jesus. We lift you up, Lord Jesus. We praise you. We thank you, Lord, for for salvation, for for forgiving us, and for giving us a new life, and the promise that we have that you're going to come again. Lord, I thank you that you're stirring us up to look forward to that coming once again. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord, that you're coming in the clouds, and we're going to go with you, and we're going to celebrate with you at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Lord, we'll be there for seven years, and we'll have that the, 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 the distribution of the rewards, Lord. We're going to see you hand out rewards, and we'll rejoice with all of those that will receive the victor's crown. Lord, they'll receive the, the crowns that you're going to give them, and Lord, they're going to pass all their crowns at your feet, Lord, for you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Lord, you are the soon coming King, and we thank you, Lord. We look forward to that. We thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that you're distributing gifts in the earth even now before you come. Prepare your church, Lord. Prepare your people, Lord, to be used by you, to to minister to the people that they meet every day. Lord, I thank you that you've already told us that you're bringing gifts of healing to the people. Lord, we thank you for the manifestation of that in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you that you touch every life that's here tonight. Lord, every family, every household that's represented, Lord, just breathe on them now, Lord. And Lord, them all, Lord, know how real you are and how how much you want to see each and every one of them. And Lord, how joyful it'll all be when we're all gathered together, all of our loved ones and all of us here tonight. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you, Lord. Oh, display your power and your blessing upon everyone tonight. Hallelujah. 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 The Lord says that he's, he's depositing courage in someone tonight. There were some that was just felt like they, they didn't have enough courage to step into that new place that they sensed God was calling them to do. But there's a new courage that's coming in and, and such, and you know that already now in your spirit. There's something that's, that's a spirit for. I mean, you, you don't have to go by your feeling, but you know God is doing something right now in your heart. Father, I thank you for that deposit of the force of courage going into them now, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for that. In Jesus' mighty name, Lord, we thank you that you're stirring up hearts. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Lord. We thank you for every dream that has been written down this past week, Lord, and people have put down. Lord, we thank you that that this is the time for dream fulfillment. Lord, I believe that every dream begins as a seed in our heart that comes from heaven. And Lord, I thank you that your word has promised so many beautiful things. And Lord, it's time for the church to receive those things, to walk in them and and see the manifestation of them. 
Lord, across the whole body of Christ. We've seen peaks and of it, and we've seen lots of manifestations of it, but Lord, we want to see even more. And we thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. We thank you that we can believe for those things that even are impossible, because Lord, nothing is ever impossible with you. Nothing is ever impossible with you. Hello, Jesse here. I know you've been blessed today, and you don't want to miss any of our upcoming videos. That's why you need to like this video, subscribe to our channel, and hit the notification bell. That notification bell lets you know when we post new videos. So like, subscribe, and hit the bell. See you next time. This media is copyrighted by Jesse Duplantis Ministries for the private use of our audience. Any other use of this media or of any pictures or accounts without Jesse Duplantis Ministries' consent is strictly prohibited.